Hi, uh, thank you so much for coming. My name is Joshua Smales. I'm a researcher at the University of Oxford. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, the CPDLC protocol used in aviation, looking at attacks on the protocol and how to prevent them. This talk is based on the work in the paper You Talking to Me, Exploring Practical Attacks on Controller Pilot Data Link Communications, which was done in collaboration with Daniel Moser, Matthew Smith, Martin Strohmeyer, Vincent Lenders, and Ivan Martinovich. Um, this was presented at the CPSS workshop at Asia CCS. Uh, you can find the paper at this link or on Google Scholar. So in this talk, we're first going to um, introduce the CPDLC protocol, then look at attacks on the protocol, um, argue for their feasibility by looking at the message diagrams of the proposed attacks and through data collection, and then look at some countermeasures which might fix the attacks. So first things first, let's look at some background of air traffic control and CPDLC. So traditionally, air traffic control is um, voice-based using a radio system. Um, it's used to direct aircraft within an airspace. Um, pilots communicate their intent and um, air traffic controllers issue other commands. The issue with this system is that it has a low bandwidth and is half duplex, meaning only one device can communicate at a time, up or down, which means it's frequently congested, especially as the number of aircraft in an airspace increases. The um, CPDLC protocol, that is Controller Pilot Data Link Communications, attempts to fix some of these issues by replacing the traditional voice air traffic control with a text-based data link. This has the benefits of um, reducing ambiguity due to the clear text messages, um, much shorter communications, which reduces the risk of a link becoming saturated, and allows parts of the system to be automated, such as um, control handovers, as we'll see soon. Um, it also allows for the opportunity to provide flight crew with additional useful information, such as maps built directly into the unit. So here we have an example CPDLC message exchange in which an ATSU, that is Air Traffic Service Unit, uh, the air traffic controller, tells the aircraft to climb to flight level 350 using the um, climb to this altitude message identifier. Um, the aircraft responds with Wilco, indicating that it will comply with the request. Um, which follows the same format as voice air traffic control, except that we add these unambiguous identifiers onto the start of the message so that the system knows what type of message it is. CPDLC doesn't have much security built in and instead aims to focus on guaranteeing availability and integrity as much as possible, much like its voice-based predecessor. Um, we use checksums to reduce the impacts of noise, but there is no guarantee of confidentiality with messages being transmitted in plain text, and we rely on human operators to guarantee authenticity rather than some kind of authentication exchange. All right, so now that that's out of the way, let's look at a threat model for this system. So we assume that any attacker has the following hardware a um, software-defined radio, which can transmit in the uh, VHF, that is very high frequency band used by CPDLC, um, a suitable antenna, and an amplifier. We also assume that they have an encoder and decoder for the CPDLC protocol. The um, dump VDL2 um, decoder is free and open source, but um, there is no encoder freely available yet, um, however the specification for CPDLC is published online, so it should not be difficult to put one together. We then assume that with this hardware an attacker is able to read all CPDLC communications within the radio horizon. Uh, we also assume they can inject arbitrary messages and block and alter arbitrary messages through destructive interference. We um, also operate on the assumption that they are unable to touch any ground-based communication between ground stations, as these are over wires and so more difficult to interfere with than radio communication.
So now that we've um, got that groundwork out of the way, we can start looking at attacks on the protocol. So the most basic form of attack is a message injection in which we set up our um, antenna between the ground station and the aircraft, and we inject a crafted message appearing to come from the legitimate ground station. In this case, we um, inject the uh, same climb to flight level 350 message that we saw in the earlier slide, and the aircraft receives this command as legitimate and returns a Wilco command to the ground station. This alerts the ground station to the attack, so it is unlikely that the attack would be very long-lived, so we need to look at more advanced attacks if we want to have more of an effect. Before we start looking at these more advanced attacks, uh, I need to first introduce the concept of a control handover in CPDLC. So much like voice-based air traffic control, um, CPDLC is split into control regions, um, each of which is controlled by one ATSU. As an aircraft moves between these control regions, the ground stations need to hand over control, and that's done through this um, message exchange. Um, so first, a uh, logon forwarding message is sent between the ground stations, and then a next data authority message is sent to the aircraft, indicating the identifier of the new ATSU that it should connect to. Another message is then sent over the ground um, to the new ground station, indicating that the aircraft has been sent this message, and then the new ATSU sends a connection request to the aircraft, which is confirmed. Occasionally there is a um, termination request confirm handshake, from the uh, old ATSU um, under certain implementations of the protocol. So we can use this handover to construct an attack in which we simply inject the messages relevant to the handover, um, telling an aircraft to connect over to this ATSU X, which is a legitimate identifier for a ground station, but one which is out of range. So we can pose as that ground station without causing any issues. So this exactly follows the CPDLC handover process, so everything appears to be legitimate from the perspective of the aircraft, um, and it will hand over to ATSUX without any issue. The one problem that we run into is this termination confirm message, which will be returned to the old ATSU upon um, completion of the handshake. This will alert the um, air traffic controller to the attack, and um, potentially cause them to reverse it. We can get around this by um, introducing message jamming to our attack. So we do this by um, reactively emitting a burst of destructive interference to block specific messages from reaching the aircraft or the ground station. Um, this has been shown in other papers to be possible, even reactively, so we should be able to put together attacks that use this, which are feasible in practice. So one approach we can take is to block the termination confirm message we see here, and that would result in a um, handover attack, which would be hard to detect until the ATSU-1 attempts to issue a new command, at which point the aircraft wouldn't respond because it had already handed over. Um, we can also put together this attack, which is a little more complicated, so I'm just going to walk us through it. So at its heart, this is taking um, a legitimate handover between ATSU1 and ATSU2 and blocking and injecting the relevant messages to make it appear to the aircraft that they are not, in fact, handing over to ATSU, but instead to ATSU-X, which is, again, controlled by our attacker. We can see that this attack works by looking at it from the perspective of each of the involved parties. So if we first look at it from the perspective of ATSU-1, by um, blocking out all the messages which ATSU-1 would not see, then we can see that um, it appears, for all intents and purposes, to be a legitimate handover to ATSU-2. Um, and then if we look at it from the perspective of the aircraft, 
then it doesn't see any of the messages that we block, and it only sees the um, injected messages with ATSUX, and it, this this appears to be a legitimate handover to ATSUX. Um, and finally, if we look at it from the perspective of ATSU2, it again appears to be a legitimate handover between ATSU1 and ATSU2. So the result of this attack is that um, the legitimate ATSUs, that is 1 and 2, think that the aircraft is connected to ATSU2. The aircraft is instead connected to ATSU-X, which is controlled by our attacker. So the impact of this attack is that we can inject arbitrary CPDLC commands to the aircraft from our ATSU-X with a much lower risk of detection, since any um, Wilco messages will be received by ATSU-X and not the um, legitimate ATSU. This allows us to do things like direct the aircraft off of its intended flight path, um, we can tell it to switch frequencies for voice air traffic control, we can instruct it to ascend or descend, and we can do a number of other things such as declaring emergencies and more. To detect this attack, the um, human operators need to be able to um, either detect unexpected or out-of-sequence messages, such as, the, um, such as the termination confirm message that we saw in the first handover attack, um, or notice a loss of voice communications, or see that the aircraft is moving unexpectedly with no commands indicating that it was going to do so. Um, or finally, they can notice that the CPDLC communication has been unusually quiet for some time. However, all of these require the operator to be especially on ball in terms of looking for these attacks, or um, in the case of aircraft movement, it requires that the attack has already succeeded, which is not what we want. Um, we want to be able to detect attacks before an attacker is able to tell an aircraft to move off its path. We also did some data collection to assess the impact of these attacks, so we set up a sensor collecting CPDLC messages above ETH Zurich overlooking the Zurich airport. We used a Raspberry Pi running the free dump VDL2 decoder, and this map shows the um, messages that we were able to detect. So as you can see, we were able to find messages up to hundreds of kilometers away. So we assume that the attacker will be able to detect messages within this range and perform attacks within this range. So this gives the attacker a huge range within which they can perform the attacks. This graph shows the um, number of CPDLC messages that we saw over time. So across the 49 day collection period, we saw 57,000 CPDLC messages um, and saw approximately one handover every six minutes within the range that we were um, collecting. So this means that the um, attacker doesn't need to do huge amounts of planning ahead of time to execute these attacks. They can simply set up their antenna, wait for a handover to occur, attempt the attack. If it fails, then they simply wait a bit for the next handover and attempt another attack shortly afterwards. So we've made the case that this is a problem. So what are we going to do about it? Well, we've proposed a number of countermeasures to the attacks described, um, some of which are easier to implement than others, some of which are more effective than others. So the first of these countermeasures involves building a graph of connections between the airspace regions. So this diagram on the right represents a potential map of adjacent airspace regions. We draw an edge on the graph whenever airspaces are adjacent to one another, so it's feasible for an aircraft to hand over between those two airspaces. Whenever the aircraft receives a message instructing it to hand over between airspace regions, it checks it against the graph. And in the case of this handover, which we outline in red, um, the edge doesn't exist on the graph, so we know that something is up. Um, in this case, we propose the following exchange of messages, um, in which the aircraft tells the ATSU that it's 
unable to fulfill the handover and requests a fallback on voice communications. This means that the pilots can um, confirm that the handover is legitimate with the air traffic controller over voice. This is really easy to implement in a backwards compatible manner because it doesn't require any hardware changes other than a minor addition to the CPDLC units on board the aircraft and doesn't require enrollments across multiple devices. However, it won't stop message injection attacks and it will only stop the handover attack in the case that the attack controlled ground station that we specify in our injected message is sufficiently far away from the airspace that the aircraft is currently in. Another potential uh, countermeasure that we looked at was the idea of interference alerts. So the um, CPDLC protocol is built into the CPDLC units, which means that we can check message exchanges against the um, understanding of the protocol to look for suspicious or non-standard message exchanges, which might indicate um, message injection or a man in the middle attack. Um, we can also look for bursts of um, high noise, that is a low signal to noise ratio, which, in, which could indicate potential destructive interference. And in each of these cases, we once again revert to voice communications using the same message exchange we looked at earlier. This is backwards compatible, and indeed it is compatible with the other countermeasure that we just looked at, but it may not catch very many attacks, and it in particular may not catch the man-in-the-middle attacks that we looked at earlier, since, as we discussed, these appear to be entirely legitimate handover exchanges to both the aircraft and the air traffic controller. A more robust countermeasure that we propose involves adding a public key infrastructure or PKI system to the CPDLC protocol. So this comes in the form of an additional box between the CPDLC unit and the radio antennas. This box stores a private public key pair for the aircraft or ATSU in question, alongside the public keys of other units in the network. This unit intercepts any CPDLC messages before they are sent by the um, aircraft or ATSU and adds a signature along with additional information such as the sender, recipient, timestamp, and what we call the home ATSU of the unit in question, which we'll discuss in a moment. Upon receiving a message, the recipient's PKI unit will um, again intercept the message, check the um, message against the signature to um, make sure that it's legitimate, and then pass on the message to the um, CPDLC units. Um, this provides a guarantee of authenticity of origin, which was not, um, not the case previously, and we don't encrypt messages to provide a safe fallback in the case that a key is not available or that the unit in question doesn't have um, PKI implemented. So the diagram here shows a typical connection request confirm handshake, which is already in CPDLC, but with these additional units. So as you can see, the, um, the aircraft's message is signed by its key, and the ATSU's message is signed by its key, um, and these are verified by the units before they're passed on. In the case that the signature is not legitimate, we um, still pass the message on to the CPDLC unit, but we... Um, alert the pilots in some way to um, tell them that the message might be the result of an attack. We also add the following message exchange to um, acquire and distribute keys. So as mentioned a moment ago, um, each aircraft and ATSU is designated a home ATSU, which is guaranteed to hold its public key. This means that if an aircraft that an ATSU doesn't recognize, sends a message, then it can perform a key request response handshake, as shown here, to acquire the key in a secure way, and then confirm the message. So this, um, this here shows a connection request confirm handshake, but um, the ATSU doesn't know the key, so it verifies it before it confirms the CPLC connection. <laughs> 
This results in a system which is more robust than the previous CPDLC system, but is not backwards compatible since it requires both parties to be enrolled in order to perform the message exchange. This, um, this system has a number of impacts, the first being that it prevents the basic message injection attacks that we saw at the start. So here we see the same um, attempted message injection attack as we saw at the beginning, except that the attacker does not have the key for the ATSU, so it's unable to provide the signature. So this means the flight crew would still see the message, but they would know that it might not be legitimate, and so they could fall back on voice communications or attempt to verify the legitimacy in some other way. It also prevents any message replay attacks, thanks to the inclusion of timestamps. So here we see an attempted message replay attack in which uh, the ATSU sends a legitimate um, climb to flight level 350 instruction to the aircraft, and then the attacker captures this message and attempts to replay it. However, thanks to the inclusion of this timestamp, the um, message will be seen as being old and the aircraft can alert the flight crew that the message has probably been replayed. This system is still potentially vulnerable to downgrade attacks in which the attacker sends a message claiming to not have yet implemented this system and um, asks the flight crew to downgrade to the um, unsigned variant of CPDLC. However, this um, this becomes much more difficult as more devices become enrolled onto this system, as it becomes more and more suspicious for an aircraft or ATSU to ask for a downgrade, so the flight crew will be able to um, monitor for potential rogue commands. However, this system may suffer from difficulties with enrollment, as it requires additional hardware on both the ATSU and the aircraft, and getting new hardware in aviation through um, approval and getting uh, manufacturers to get on board may be quite a challenging prospect. So there are a number of directions which we can take this work in the future. So firstly, a um, further security analysis of CPDLC would be incredibly useful to understand the full range of attacks beyond the ones that we've looked at here. Um, there's certainly potential for larger scale attacks involving multiple attack control antennae to um, potentially attack multiple aircraft or ground stations at once. It would also be useful to demonstrate the attacks that we've um, looked at here on actual CPDLC hardware, which we have been unable to get our hands on just yet. And similarly, uh, it would be useful to concretely implement some of the countermeasures that we've looked at here. So there are a number of key takeaways from the work here. The first thing is that CPDLC is fundamentally insecure. Um, of course, this is already a known issue since um, messages aren't signed and there is no guarantee of authenticity. However, we um, in this work also showed that it is not sufficient to trust that the human operators will be able to verify the system's security since the attacks that we looked at look like entirely legitimate message exchanges to the human operators. We show that attacks on CPDLC can cause significant disruption and delays. And finally, we showed that it was difficult but possible to fix some of the problems with CPDLC through um, the countermeasures that we discussed. Thank you so much for listening. There will be a Q&A in the DEF CON Discord following this talk um, if you'd like to see more of this, um, please read the paper linked here. And um, if you have any more questions, feel free to shoot me an email. Thank you.